Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm happy to welcome you to our Haddon Forum in the UAB College of Arts and Sciences. I'm David Schwebel, Associate Dean in the college, and uh, very happy to be introducing our speaker, Dr. Natalie Todak, today. Uh, before I uh, introduce Dr. Todak, let me briefly mention that we uh, this is the last forum of the fall semester. We will have two Haddon Forums in the spring semester. On February 12th, Dr. Miles Moody from the Department of Sociology will be talking about race and discrimination. And on March 12th, Dr. Magda Slavarsky uh, from Sociology will present uh, some of her very recent findings on cultural differences in the COVID-19 pandemic and how people in different cultures and countries uh, have responded. So today I have the privilege to introduce, uh, I think one of our real rising stars in the UAB College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dr. Natalie Todak. Um, Dr. Todak earned her bachelor's uh, degree from UCSD and then moved uh, across the country to Bowling Green where she earned her master's in criminal justice. And then she uh, moved back west to Arizona State and earned her PhD in criminology and criminal justice. Uh, she spent a year briefly at Washington State University and then uh, moved here to UAB to join our faculty in 2017. Uh, since joining the UAB faculty, I can say Natalie has published and published an awful lot. Uh, I, I counted 17 peer-reviewed papers in the last three years uh, since joining our faculty, which many of you know is, is really quite remarkable. Uh, but when I was looking at her CV, a, a different thing kind of jumped out at me, and that's um, excellent uh, performance and something that I think is often forgotten in our jobs as faculty members, which is mentoring our students. Um, and I was looking through Natalie's CV and all the many, many students she's mentored. And I wanna share with you a few of the titles of the fascinating topics her undergraduate honor students and her master's students are studying. So one of them is called Annotated Bibliography on the History of Women in US Police Leadership and Notable Women Chiefs of 2020. Another one, Understanding and Improving the Police Response to Suspected Cases of Human Trafficking. Uh, perceptions of the Police by Queer Women. De-escalation on paper, but business as usual. A qualitative analysis of police use of force policies. And I think we'll be hearing some of those themes in her talk today. Uh, as you might guess, Natalie's research focuses on really cutting edge topics in criminal justice and policing. Uh, topics like evidence-based policing, diversity among police forces, health and wellness among criminal justice professionals. She's one of those rare researchers that, that pulls off using mixed methods, both qualitative strategies and quantitative strategies to seek answers to her scientific questions. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Natalie Todak, Body-Worn Cameras and Police Accountability, High Hopes, Lackluster Evidence. Thank you, Dean Schwebel. Um, and can you hear me okay on your end? Yes, we're good. Right. Thank you so much for those kind words. And hello, UAB community and members of the public listening today. I'm grateful to have been selected to give one of the Haddam lectures this semester and to have the opportunity to share my research and ideas with you all. Uh, as the Dean said, I'm Natalie Todak. I'm an assistant professor of criminal justice here at UAB. And my research is focused on a variety of issues in US policing. And today I'll be talking to you about body worn cameras and police accountability. And just a couple notes, one, um, body-worn cameras are often designated as BWCs throughout the slides. And I'll also be kind of giving the signal to the Dean to switch the slides because I um, apparently couldn't figure out the, the technical difficulties on the doing the, the dual screen. So uh, I'll just say next slide, please. And uh, uh, we'll get started here. Okay, so next slide. Um, just to give you a quick idea of my experience in the subject area of police body worn cameras, I've assisted or led on projects investigating the effects of police body worn cameras in seven different police agencies um, in different areas of the United States, ranging from Los Angeles to Washington State and Arizona, and also right here in Jefferson County, Alabama. I've also evaluated the diffusion of body worn camera technology across the United States. And I've used body-worn camera video footage as data to facilitate research on other policing topics, such as use of force decision-making and de-escalation. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to begin this lecture by giving an overview of the circumstances in which police body-worn cameras spread across the United States over the past five years. 
Next, I'll talk about the impressive body of research that has generally done well to keep pace with the rapid diffusion of the technology. And I'll give you some idea of what the evidence is telling us so far. And finally, I'm going to situate body-worn cameras within the larger discussion of police reform and accountability that I'm sure many of us are aware is going on right now in this country. Um, slide, please. Police body-worn cameras are part of a larger trend in American law enforcement to adopt state-of-the-art technological in innovations to do things like facilitate or minimize the use of force, like tasers, to aid in criminal investigations, like DNA testing, and to increase police efficiency, like hotspots analyses and comp stat. Body cameras are also compatible with the growing practice among many citizens to rely on video cameras to serve as checks on police behaviors. This is most evident through the use of cell phones, but also through demands that agencies release video evidence from CCTV, dashboard, or surveillance cameras in the aftermath of a critical incident. Some courtroom actors are also reporting the emergence of a new CSI effect among jurors who have grown to expect video camera evidence and sometimes refuse to render a decision in a case without it. With this information alone, it should come as no surprise that body-worn cameras proliferated as fast and as far as they did. Body-worn cameras were already emerging on the law enforcement landscape in the United Kingdom and in Australia as early as 2005, and were introduced in the US and Canada in 2010. Media attention to the new technology began to surge as early as 2013, prompting about one third of all police departments in the United States to adopt body-worn cameras by that year. Slide, please. However, interest in body-worn cameras skyrocketed in the aftermath of the summer of 2014, when our nation's long underlying history of racial tension between police officers and marginalized communities came to a head once again when Officer Darren, Darren Wilson of the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department shot and killed Michael Brown, an unarmed black man who was accused of shoplifting. No video was taken of the fatal shooting. The events that took place were hotly contested and ultimately anti-police protests and riots erupted across the country. Brown's death and a series of other highly controversial deaths in police custody, including the more recent deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor this summer, have collectively sparked the most intense and polarized social debate over police reform since the civil rights era, save for possibly the videotape beating of Rodney King. The 2020 Gallup poll on confidence in institutions observed the lowest levels for police since they began collecting these data in 1993, with 59% of white respondents and 19% of black respondents expressing confidence in police. It is very clear that policing, race, and the use of force are some of the defining social issues of our time. At the same time, the job of the police officer is growing increasingly more stressful and challenging. An unclear professional mandate results in the police being increasingly called upon for all forms of complex social issues that have no immediate resolution and for which they have not been sufficiently trained. Police today are routinely called on to resolve parenting disputes and domestic disagreements. They're asked to fix poverty, mental illness, addiction, suicide, respond to riots, hostage situations, and even mass and school shootings, to name only a few. Combined with intense social criticism and a widespread resistance amongst cops to seek help, the field of law enforcement is facing a devastating hiring crisis, a growing rift with the public, an epidemic of officer suicides, and of course, a widespread social movement demanding police reform. Next slide, please. In a perfect storm of events, body-worn cameras exploded across the US land, land, law enforcement landscape in the aftermath of Michael Brown's death. The first critical factor contributing to this explosion was an early study conducted in Rialto, California, that reported massive 60% declines in the use of force and 90% declines in citizen complaints following the implementation of cameras in that department. The second factor was the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, which identified body-worn cameras as critical tools for improving police-citizen relationships, 
on the basis that they provided a more objective account of police citizen encounters than officer or citizen accounts offered on their own, which was then followed up by millions of dollars in federal funding, training, technical assistance, and other resources made available to agencies across the country for purchasing and implementing cameras, of which a handful of agencies here in Jefferson County were also recipients. As shown in the quote here, Perhaps the most critical driving force behind the, drive, the rapid diffusion of body-worn cameras in the United States was the unprecedented consensus of support for the idea. Communities in the midst of the growing crisis between cops and citizens were demanding that their local agencies do something to show they were trying to change. By and large, one of the biggest demands was for body-worn cameras, compelled by high expectations that they would accomplish a slew of positive effects. Police agencies simultaneously sought out ways to show they were listening to the people, and body-worn cameras represented a tangible option that did not fully transform the way policing was already organized and performed. By 2016, the Law Enforcement Management and Administrative Statistics Survey reported 50% of all police agencies had fully adopted body-worn cameras, including between 60 and 80% of large agencies. In other words, the number of agencies that had fully acquired body-worn cameras doubled between 2013 and 2016. The Lemus report also found almost 90% of the agencies had already implemented formal body-worn camera policies, signaling that body-worn cameras had been fully institutionalized into their general operations. All signs pointed to body-worn cameras as the new reality in 2016. Next slide, please. Communities were optimistic that body-worn cameras would increase transparency of policing behaviors and police-citizen interactions, improve citizen attitudes towards and trust in police, civilize police interactions in ways that would reduce conflict, use of force, and unnecessary deaths in police custody. Others predicted that body-worn cameras would improve justice and court case outcomes with the availability of high-quality video evidence. And it was believed that body-worn camera video would offer unprecedented opportunities for police training and academic research. While there were certainly concerns about body cameras, including whether their high costs justified their potential benefits, as well as their impact on citizen privacy in their most vulnerable moments, hopes were definitely high in 2015 and 2016 that body-worn cameras could be the solution many people were looking for. Next slide, please. So I'm here to talk today about another anticipated benefit of police body-worn cameras, and perhaps the one that's most commonly discussed in the context of police reform. And that's the argument that body-worn cameras will contribute to societal and legal efforts to hold officers accountable in instances when they engage in misconduct. And this thesis has two components. First is the assumption that when they are aware their words and actions are being recorded, police officers who are prone to misconduct will instead think twice about doing so. Thus, body-worn cameras could encourage officers to behave in ways that are more consistent with their organization's policies and in ways that are fair, just, and constitutional. For example, in an August 2013 ruling, Judge Shira Scheinlin argued that the use of stop, question, and frisk as practiced by the New York Police Department unconstitutionally targeted racial minorities routinely violating their Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable stops and seizures, and their 14th Amendment rights to equal protections under the law. She cued in on officers' common justifications for conducting the stops, which often included um, explanations like furtive movement, bulge in pocket, high crime area, and looking out of place and which ultimately resulted in very low hit rates for weapons, drugs, and other evidence of criminal behavior to the tune of only about 10%. Important for our discussion, in her ruling, the judge called on the NYPD to adopt body-worn cameras to remedy the problem of racial profiling in their decisions to stop question and frisk. The tacit assumption in the argument here is that when they are aware they're being recorded, police officers will only stop question and frisk individuals when they have a compelling reason to suspect that a crime is being or was committed. 
The second assumption is that body-worn camera footage will aid in discipline and or prosecution efforts when officers violate policy or the law. Most of us are aware that the last eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd's life were recorded by bystanders on cell phones and uploaded and immediately viewed by millions. But as we also know, there are limitations to relying on smartphone video to serve as checks on police behavior. For one, they require a person to register that a critical event may be occurring, to retrieve their phone, and then to begin videotaping. For this reason, when a viral video involving the police emerges, we often hear the argument that we don't know the full story, particularly the part that happened before the video started. We don't know what prompted the particular police response, maybe the person shot at them first, etc. Basically, a cell phone video very rarely shows the full story and often fails to clearly establish if the police were in the wrong or not. In the case of George Floyd, the Minneapolis officers recorded body-worn camera video from the moment they accepted the call from dispatch. Derek Chauvin is being charged with second-degree murder, which applies when someone is believed to have intentionally inflected bodily harm, which unintentionally caused death. And what the body camera video could, potential, could potentially offer to the case here is a specific portion of audio in which we can hear one officer advise him that he should probably turn Floyd over because he was, quote, worried about excited delirium. This new evidence recorded by body worn camera in the immediate proximity of Chauvin as he was kneeling on George Floyd's neck is potentially revealing of whether he intended to cause bodily harm. This case is just one of many examples of how body-worn camera video could influence or at least contribute to efforts to prosecute or discipline officers when they are accused of wrongdoing. So just to recap, the hypothesis that we're diving into today is twofold. First, that the presence of a camera will encourage proper behavior. And second, that the video will assist in holding officers accountable when they commit misconduct. As I'll make clear later on, the research testing this hypothesis is unfortunately almost non-existent. But before we dig in and investigate that problem and the merits of the accountability hypothesis, I wanna first step back and talk about the body, the body of research on body-worn cameras and give you a sense of what the evidence is telling us so far. Um, next slide, please. Because body-worn cameras were rapidly adopted in response to a nationwide policing crisis, they were initially implemented in a low research environment. And this is a short way of saying that agencies were spending thousands and some even millions of dollars on body camera programs without proof they would produce the intended effects and were equipping officers with new technology with no policy guidance and no sense of whether it might pose unanticipated or harmful consequences. For example, the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department announced their officers were wearing cameras less than three weeks after the fatal shooting of Michael Brown. The prospect that cameras were spreading like wildfire, either on the agency's own accords or in response to pressure from city government and from communities, with zero information about their potential impact, was frankly a bit scary for academics and for other interest groups. However, it's also evident that this fear lit a fire in researchers and also in funding sources, because today, just six years later, there are over 120 confirmed peer-reviewed studies on body-worn cameras, and that's probably closer to 150 here today in November of 2020. What's more impressive is the fact that a significant portion of these studies use rigorous randomized controlled trial designs which is considered the gold standard in evaluation research and which for various reasons is very uncommon in policing research. In their meta-analysis of research testing the impact of body cameras on police and citizen behaviors, Lum and her colleagues found that two thirds of the studies they reviewed had used an RCT design. They compared this body of work to research on license plate readers, which also experienced a rapid diffusion across US law enforcement in the early 2000s, but it has to this day only been evaluated a handful of times. Um, next slide, please. The body of research shows high levels of acceptance from police officers 
with qualitative research telling us that police think cameras protect them against unfair complaints and disciplinary inquiries and are generally helpful in report writing and for showing what they saw in a particular situation. Officers also appreciate that video can sometimes help get them back on the streets faster when they are accused of wrongdoing because the video sheds light on what transpired and eliminates the he said, she said dilemma that frequently plagues the citizen complaint process. Body-worn cameras are also generally supported by citizens with even those who are most supportive of the police feeling that cameras will show officers doing a great job and potentially ease some of the criticism directed at them. Three rigorous studies have documented that body-worn cameras are related to increased citizen perceptions of procedural justice during their encounters with police. Similarly, studies have consistently shown declines in citizen complaints. And Anthony Braga and his team found that the Las Vegas Police Department saved $4 million a year when they adopted body cameras, largely as a result of less time and resources spent investigating citizen complaints. A recent meta-analysis published this year reported less clear impacts on officer, and activity officer activity levels and decision-making, as well as on citizen behaviors and their encounters with police. Body-worn cameras do not have a clear effect on officers' self-initiated activities or arrest behaviors, or on dispatch calls for service, or assaults or resistance behaviors directed against the, the police. Thus, we can currently reject the hypothesized civilizing effect of body-worn cameras, which predicted significant declines in conflict between cops and citizens. And we can also reject the so-called Ferguson effect, which predicted that officers were becoming passive in their jobs to avoid situations where they might get in trouble, injured, or killed. Um, next slide, please. Studies examining the impact of body-worn cameras on police use of force also show very inconsistent results. On one hand, several found significant declines in the use of force after BWC deployment, including the study in Rialto that I mentioned earlier, which is listed near the top of this figure. However, as you go down this figure from top to bottom, many others have found no significant relationship between body-worn cameras and use of force and the direction of the effects in these non-significant findings are inconsistent across studies. Next slide, please. Experts currently disagree over how to interpret this evidence. In response to what they characterized as mixed and underwhelming results, Lum and colleagues speculated that we may have overestimated the potential impact of body-worn cameras, pointing to the fact that the push for cameras was initially motivated by hopes that police shootings and other forms of coercive force would go down. This disappointment has been increasingly shared by members of the public in recent years, especially following the highly publicized results of a randomized control trial conducted with over 2,000 officers in Washington, DC, which found no change in use of force following the implementation of cameras. The authors concluded that society should, quote, recalibrate its expectations of body cameras' ability to induce large-scale behavioral changes in policing. The study results were widely shared on national media platforms, with one NPR headline arguing that, quote, having police officers wear cameras seems to have no discernible impact. Next slide, please. Other researchers paint a more optimistic picture in their interpretation of the evidence. Some have argued that the starting point and initial motivations for adopting a new body-worn camera program, as well as the level of pre-implementation planning that is undertaken by an agency, can significantly shape the impact of body-worn cameras on officers, agencies, and communities. Gobbin White pointed out that the Rialto Police Department had a rocky history leading up to their study with several scandals and an attempt by the city council to shut down the department. The new chief, Tony Farrer, was hired in 2011 and implemented a number of reforms, including body-worn cameras, which led to the substantial declines observed in both use of force and complaints. Other agencies have taken steps to reform their agency prior to implementing cameras, with some implementing cameras following involvement in collaborative reform and witnessing more marginal declines in the use of force. 
The Washington DC and LAPD departments were both under federal oversight through consent decree. And after 10 years of federally imposed reform, neither agency saw reductions in use of force when body worn cameras were deployed. Thus, agencies that have undergone significant reform efforts prior to adopting cameras will probably not see the noticeable declines in use of force that many people expect to see. While more agent, while more age, excuse me, while agencies exhibiting more problems with the use of force will observe more effects because they simply have greater room for improvement. Next slide, please. There are several outcomes that have not received attention in the research so far. Significant for our purposes, there have been next to no studies examining the impact of body cameras on outcomes like racial disparities, police community relations, or police accountability outcomes. In a national survey of prosecutors, Marola and colleagues found that nearly all prosecutors that they surveyed reported using cameras to further cases against citizen defendants, while only 8% said they had used one to prosecute an officer. Thus, while we have minimal evidence, there is reason to believe that body-worn cameras are not being widely used for these purposes. Next slide, please. So in the absence of evidence, let's dissect the claim that body-worn cameras could serve as effective tools for holding police accountable when they engage in misconduct. Recall the first component of this hypothesis is that officers will behave better when they are aware they're being recorded. The first problem here is that while most agencies currently have their officers wearing cameras, there is no consensus on what they should do with the video. We are seeing in some cases a backfire effect when communities know their officers have cameras, expect to see video footage from a contested incident, and are ultimately denied the opportunity to view the footage. Research participants that I've surveyed here in Jefferson County raised the question of how videos could possibly hold anyone accountable if the videos are not made available for view. An experience shows us that the presence of a body-worn camera will have little impact on misconduct if officers don't expect footage to be reviewed. A recently fired deputy in Jackson County, Florida is so far charged with planting drugs on 16 drivers directly in view of his body-worn camera before he was discovered by members of the courthouse. It's evident in this particular case that no one from within his agency was reviewing footage from his arrests or possibly that they did not care that he was falsely arresting them for crimes they didn't commit. A related issue is that the technology relies on officers to activate before it can be effective. A recent investigation into the Chicago Police Department reportedly found tens of thousands of calls for service that were not recorded on a camera since their rollout in 2015, immediately following the death of Laquan McDonald. Importantly, these activation failures occurred despite a mandatory activation policy in the Chicago PD, requiring all officers to record their every encounter with a citizen. A third reason to doubt the hypothesis are that videos continue to pop up, depicting contested, questionable, and even clearly problematic behavior committed by an officer who was aware they were being filmed. The fact that two body-worn cameras and a number of cell phones were aimed directly at Derek Chauvin as he kneeled on George Floyd's neck did not appear to affect his behavior or decision-making in that moment. Making this point, Erin Carrison and her colleagues recently argued that civilians and officers alike have always known images of unjust state violence, and the presentation of even the most damning evidence does not necessarily deter officers from violating constitutional protections or reduce the likelihood of them being acquitted when they do. Their study found Black Baltimore residents were not as supportive of body-worn cameras as participants in other published studies. Some felt the videos simply contributed to the excessive con consumption and what one characterized as the fetishization of Black suffering in America with little obvious contribution to police accountability. And I think this point is connected with the flaws in the second part of the hypothesis, the idea that body-worn camera video evidence will help in efforts to hold police accountable when they break the law on duty. The first flaw in this argument is the obvious one, Body-worn camera video is not a perfect Hollywood movie industry quality 
360 degree portrayal of what happened during any encounter. They fall off, they only show a single perspective, and we've already discussed the problem of activation failure, which results in no video at all. Moreover, if you've kept up with major cases in the past few years, you'll notice that people have very different interpretations of videos involving the police. And we know from research that the manner in which individuals are primed with pre-existing attitudes or via news media framing can significantly influence their interpretation of a particular video. More broadly, people have wide ranging views on what they expect from members of law enforcement and with what they consider to be moral or just behavior. And most people are simply not well informed either through an understanding of the law or of police work. Thus, even with concrete video evidence, we may not see body camera video being the great equalizer. Second, our legal system in this country is simply not set up to hold police officers accountable when they engage in misconduct. For example, the Supreme Court's 1989 decision in Graham versus Connor held that the use of force is justified if a reasonable officer at the time of the incident would have perceived an immediate threat of serious bodily harm to the officer or to the public, regardless of whether in hindsight, the threat turns out to have been justified. The reasonable officer test takes into account the totality of the circumstances and leaves a lot of discretion to the officer in order to acknowledge the challenges and dangers that are inherent in the job of policing and to offer leeway given the difficulties of making life or death decisions in a moment's notice while under stress. We see a similar issue with the use of no knock and quick knock police raids as some of us may have recently learned for the first time this summer in the case of Brianna Taylor, and as I learned reading the work of Dr. Hadar Aviram. The principle of announcement before entry is fundamental in our nation's laws for two reasons. First, to protect unnecessary damage of property, and second, to avoid the provocation of violence that may arise in self-defense by the surprised resident, to roughly quote Justice Scalia in Wilson v. Arkansas and in Hudson v. Michigan. However, in Hudson and also in Richards v. Wisconsin, the court opened the door for police to identify special circumstances in which they might decide not to knock or announce, ultimately offering police wide discretion to decide whether or not to knock. On this foundation, we saw the officer charged with the bullets that he shot into the empty neighboring apartments and not with the ones that entered Breonna Taylor's apartment and ultimately which caused her death. All this to say, police, or excuse me, people who expect to see their moral attitudes about what constitutes appropriate police behavior in a specific situation reflected in or vindicated by the law will often find themselves disappointed, video or no video. Next slide, please. Like most of the world's most complex issues, the path forward is paved with questions. We have a few that are fairly straightforward, but also some that are more complex and will require long-term, thoughtful, and deliberate effort and collaboration. However, as you'll probably have already begun to suspect, body-worn cameras are simply a tool to assist in efforts to address misconduct, but are certainly not a solution. I'm going to break my suggestions here out into those for researchers, for cops, courts, and then for people. Academics first should seek out evidence-based policies that dictate when an officer should activate their camera and what happens when they do not. We need evidence-based policies on video review and to identify effective disciplinary procedures for misconduct caught on video. And there is of course some work being done in this area as we speak. We also need evidence-based policies specifying if and when videos will be released to the public and this is something that I've been collecting data on here in Jefferson County. All of this will require collaborative research between police agencies and academic researchers. As Sam Walker argued in his book, Taming the System, there is no single remedy to police misconduct. It is a highly complex issue that requires a multi-pronged approach and continuing analysis. Yet very few researchers have taken up a magnifying glass to study the problem since Walker published his book. And of course there are exceptions, but for various reasons, including a hesitance by agencies to consent to research on misconduct, 
and an unwillingness among academics to burn bridges with lucrative research partners, police misconduct is just not a highly common area of study. Perhaps then I might recommend that researchers need to find the courage to continue investigating the causes and forms of police misconduct and to continue to seek out effective mechanisms for curbing it. Police agencies on their part need to reckon with the critical importance of the task of rooting out misconduct within their ranks. Most importantly, they should acknowledge and work hard to fully dismantle the blue wall of silence that prohibits officers from informing on their peers when they observe actions that are counter to constitutional and ethical standards. The pattern and practice of officers covering up for each other and retaliating against those who make the decision to blow the whistle on misconduct needs to be laid to rest. As Sam Walker has frequently argued, the court system will need to play a fundamental role in remedying police misconduct, but has in recent years wavered in defining constitutional protections for individual rights and for requiring the appropriate remedies for violations, including the exclusion of evidence. Thus, until our courts take a stronger stand against police misconduct, officers will retain exceedingly wide discretion in making life or death decisions. And finally, to citizens, I argue that it is unreasonable to expect officers to behave in any specific way when we as a society do not have a consensus on how we want them to act. Our society calls on the police for any and all, excuse me, for any and all of our life's problems that we want someone to do something about right now to roughly quote Egon Bit Bittner. The police have no clear cut role. What we, perceive in, it, what we perceive of as right or wrong is not always aligned with what is lawful, lawful or unlawful. Moral attitudes vary considerably across people and a comprehensive understand, undertaking is desperately needed to clarify or redefine the police mission and to lay out our specific expectations for what constitutes appropriate police behavior. Only then can we begin to identify areas for reform from recruitment and hiring to organizational policy and comprehensive accountability systems of which body-worn cameras will certainly play a role. In conclusion, Body-worn cameras are not a silver bullet solution to police misconduct, despite initially high expectations that fostered their rapid diffusion across US law enforcement. They are not a crutch that we can lean on to hold police officers accountable when they violate our trust or the law. They are an evidentiary tool for gaining a complete, but yet a, a more complete yet still imperfect understanding of a highly complex and ever-changing societal problem that requires much more than a video camera to resolve. They can, however, aid in facilitating our efforts to ensure police are properly performing their duties to protect and serve. Thank you. Terrific, thanks so much, Dr. Todak. Wonderful talk and uh, I'm sure that we have provoked some thoughts and questions. So. As many of you who have attended Head and Forms in the past uh, know that we, we really like to have some intellectual exchange and conversation now. It's a little harder on Zoom, but we uh, will manage our best. So I'm going to ask then, um, for those of you who, to, who have questions, to go ahead and type them into the chat box. And I will read and kind of monitor, and, and we can also unmute people for conversation if it makes sense. And maybe while some of you are thinking or typing into the chat box, I'll take the liberty of, of asking a first question. And, you know, Natalie, one of the goals of, of the Haydn Forum is to kind of exchange ideas across disciplines and across research areas. So when I saw your title, I didn't think there would be any overlap in my research area, which some of you know is in, in injury prevention, but something occurred to me and I'm curious to get your thoughts. So. Um, once someone is injured, in some cases, the paramedics come. And uh, there's actually some evidence that paramedics don't always do the right thing when they reach a crisis, that they sometimes may provide the wrong medical intervention or, or, or behave uh, in, in a way that actually harms the victim more than helping them. So I, I guess my question is whether anyone's ever talked about body cameras on, on paramedics. And if you think some of the lessons that we've learned from policing might apply to that domain. I'm not aware of any empirical research looking at that, but I do remember 
that was one of the major concerns that came up when agencies first started planning and implementing body cameras were the questions of, you know, recording medical conversations between, um, you know, people who had been injured and maybe HIPAA protected. And then there's the other concern. Officers are always walking in and out of emergency rooms and should they turn on their cameras or should they keep it off? So I'm not aware of any research on, you know, for example, paramedics experiences or attitudes with body worn cameras. But like anything else, um, you know, there's an ongoing debate about federal agents being recorded on cameras or medical professionals being recorded. Those are things that are those unanticipated consequences that re that require more research um, to look at. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. So let me turn to the chat box. You've got praise from a few people, but we do have a question here from John Latine, Latine, who asks, Dr. Todak, is there any research regarding the discretionary operation of BWC versus BWC that automatically engage? I don't know of any research on that topic, um, but I do know that um, the discretionary operation is probably preferred for cost saving reasons and for other practical reasons. Um, so as, as some of you may be aware, it costs millions of dollars for you know, the medium to large sized agencies to store all of their video evidence that comes in and that they're required to keep for a certain amount of time. So the automatic um, activation, um, aside from you know, possibility of, of practical uh, you know, malfunction will likely just continue to generate videos that then have to be saved on, on a data platform. And then I'm sure there are uh, unions that would, you know, push back on automatically uh, engaging a body camera for various workplace environment issues as well. But no, I'm not aware of research that looks at the difference between those two. Good, thanks. Are there other questions? If you're more comfortable, I think our group is small enough that if you want to turn on your camera and wave rather than typing, I'm, I'm happy I'm trying to scroll through some of the, the pictures here. And I'm sure there are body camera experts on here too that if they want to jump in, I'm happy to give up the, the uh, I see Eric Pisa in here. He knows a lot about this as well, but. Thanks, Eric, or anyone else have thoughts to share? Go, go ahead, Eric. I was, I was typing, uh, I didn't have my camera on because my cat is doing <laughs> what she does and getting in the way. Um, but since Natalie called me out, I'll stop typing and I'll ask my question. Um, Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> Uma loves getting airtime, so it's okay. Um, so I, I live in New Jersey and the New Jersey state legislator is actually considering passing some laws that would require pretty much most police departments in the state to invest in body cameras, right? I, I think it's like a certain threshold, but if you look at the population requirements, it would be, you know, the vast majority of, of police agencies would need to go down that road. So in your opinion, given, given your background, um, given the cost associated, given how complex, uh, you know, the, you know, the, 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 how complex it is to effectively deploy body cameras. What's your opinion on that kind of top-down forcing of body cameras? Do you think that's a good idea, a bad idea? Um, just interested in your perspective. Yeah, it's a complicated question because um, on one hand, you could imagine some communities just not, not having not not seeing the benefit of spending all the money to implement cameras and then not seeing the benefits that we know are somewhat mixed in the research. But in my opinion, I view body worn cameras as a fundamental component of democratic policing, much like um, in, you know, including citizen input in your police decision making and, and so forth. I think that these are becoming a, an expected component of showing that you are a transparent and democratic police department that has nothing to hide. 
So I think it's an empirical question of whether there might be communities out there, maybe smaller communities that just simply uh, the, the money would not be worth the investment. But with the way that our society is moving forward, I would argue that it's probably coming to stay and, and will be expected. All right, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks. So while, while we were talking, John uh, entered a response into the chat. He says, from a legal standpoint, it's that discretionary use of BCW, BCW is the real concern because of the failure to preserve such evidence. Excellent. So the, there's two other questions in the chat that I think are related. So I'm going to clump them together as one. So Mika Tamir in UAB sociology department asks, how does this research on body-worn cameras compare to research on dashboard cameras? And then Catherine Danilo, Associate Dean, asked a related question, are BWC replacing the car cameras? Um, so there is quite a bit of research out there on dashboard cameras, but it has not generated, you know, the, the same kind of fervor of everyone rushing to study it and all the money kind of being fun, funneled into it as, as, um, as body-worn cameras have. So, and I think the my answer kind of connects those two questions is dashboard cameras expect um, that police and citizens are going to stand right in front of the car for most of their encounters. So they are great for traffic um, uh, stops and they are also they, they capture audio if, if the officer has a mic that is attached to the dashboard, but most police encounters are not going to be performed in front of the, the windshield, right? So they're gonna go into a house. So they're gonna, you know, kind of park down the street and then approach kind of in a, in a tactically sound way. So they're, they're not gonna stand in front of the, the dashboard cam. So I imagine if we were looking at um, things that were happening right in front of the dashboard camera, that the evidence would kind of be the same. But aside from that, everything else is going to require that camera to move with the officer so that we can hear it and so forth. So, and dashboard cameras kind of suffer from the same questions or the same limitations as cell phones do. They're not going to be right up in, in up, cl up close and personal in the encounter. They're going to miss a lot of the, uh, of the recording that, that we would like to see. So I think uh, they're not replacing dashboard cameras, though I haven't heard of anyone getting body worn cameras and and doing away with the dashboard cams. But um, it's possible that if you're doing a, a budget analysis, that that might be something that you you would consider. Good, thanks. Any other questions? We'll just give it one more minute. OK, so there are two that came in. So let me read first. Stephen Zhang asked, Dr. Todak, what are your opinions on what would improve the usage of BWC? Um, I, I think maybe what he's asking is um, improve activation, um, ensure that officers um, activate their cameras, or are you asking about um, encourage more agencies to adopt them? I'm not sure. Stephen, do you want to clarify usage rate? So that, that, that's talking about activation. So usage in, in terms of activation, if they're wearing it. Okay, so there is some evidence that having a more dis, um, a limited uh, policy that says this is when you activate this camera and this is when you don't, that uh, increases activation rate. There is very limited evidence on this activation rate um, question and um, it, for anybody who's, who's endeavored to try to study it knows connecting video data to um, call data is kind of sometimes a nightmare. So this has been a, a challenging research question, um, but there is work being done to kind of isolate a policy that requires that um, officers activate. And as I mentioned in my talk, agencies have to follow that up with what happens if you don't, right? And sometimes um, we can understand that there might be some kind of maybe a, a one, two warning system where you make one mistake because there are situations where the event happens to you and you don't get a chance to hit the button. Um, but um, there, there, if, if we, it, I would argue that there should be systems in place when we start to see a pattern of an officer not activating, something needs to happen um, in that situation. 
And then uh, you mentioned the body-worn camera has created a CSI effect on jurors. There is very minimal uh, research out there on um, the use of body-worn cameras in the courts. Most of that work has been qualitative um, interviews and focus groups with prosecutors and, and lawyers and judges. And that is where I came up with um, my argument that, that some are arguing that there is a quote new CSI effect, but that's based on qualitative perceptions and not based on any um, quantitative you know, statistics looking at uh, the specific effect on decisions and court case outcomes. Um, there's a little bit of work looking at the impact of body cameras on case outcomes. Um, a, a research study conducted in Arizona found that they lead to more convictions in domestic violence cases or, or um, intimate partner violence cases. Um, but that body of work, there's nine studies currently, and uh, they're they're kind of still kind of building that that body of work. So I don't have any specific um, takeaways for you at this time. Um, I've got a private question here that says, what's the best way to set expectations for when to release footage to the public? This is the question that I'm grappling with myself. Um, state laws all vary in terms of when or whether agencies are required to release a video and how um, individuals can go about asking for that footage. I think all of this requires a lot more data. Uh, we need to know, you know, I think it's going to be a cost benefit analysis because on one hand, releasing a video too soon, there are issues with privacy that are there are issues with um, inflaming public opinion. There are um, issues with um, affecting uh, litigation and due process. But when we don't see a video, um, kind of we see this narrative kind of take shape and the truth starts to form without any evidence and this kind of this can inflame um, public um, outrage as well. So I think before we set precedent on how and whether to release footage, uh, we need more data. Um, but if you're asking from my personal opinion, I think we might get to that stage where someone's going to record it anyways. So it's probably going to be police agencies releasing that video sooner and getting involved in the narrative and helping to make sure that the uh, all of the information is there um, and, and that the public kind of isn't creating their own narrative that may or may not be um, accurate. Thanks. There's two questions in the chat. We've got about six minutes left, so maybe we can close with those last two questions. Do you want to, do you want to read them, Natalie, or should I read them out loud? Sure. Hi, Frank. How are you doing? Um, he says uh, his local department in New Jersey just purchased a system that activates the camera whenever an officer pulls the firearm. Um, if so, I, I actually don't have a lot of information on these. I'm aware that they're being, uh, you know, pilot tested and, and things like that. I don't see a huge issue with that um, if it if it works well and doesn't, um, you know, uh, the only negative that I can see to that is if it doesn't work and then you have a shooting that didn't get recorded um, because the officer is relying on that that uh, system to automatically record. Um, but I mean, you could you could see. Um, I, I don't see any other harm to that as long as it's not, you know, being relied on and then uh, malfunctioning. And the last question from Alejandra is, would it be best to apply discourse analysis to these videos? Um, so I'm not quite familiar with discourse analysis, but if we're talking about maybe um, linguistic um, you know, looking at different uh, ways that communication is happening between cops and citizens to study is that am I am I accurately? That would be my interpretation. And sometimes in a in a, a a qualitative method, but using quantitative strategies to understand the discourse. Yeah. So body worn camera video is kind of this this wellspring of data that that we could be using to study anything from you know, uh, interactions and de-escalation and the factors that lead to conflict and violence and all, th all sorts of things. Um, I've argued in my dissertation uh, that we could use it to study how 
how good police officers generate positive outcomes and then use that for police training. There's, uh, there's unlimited opportunities. The problem is uh, you gotta find people who are willing to sit down and watch hundreds of hours of video and code those things, which uh, and you got to find someone who doesn't get car sick and, and all those different uh, challenges of, of, you know, research uh, labs and things like that. So if you have the money and you have the students to sit down and watch all those videos, then um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a unlimited source for research data that we could be using right now. Great. Well, thank you so much. There's lots of praise on the chat window. I'll, I'll offer a virtual applause here as well. Uh, thanks so much. Fascinating topic, timely, important, and uh, really appreciate what I think was a rich presentation for all of us to learn from. Yeah. Uh, everyone, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the holiday season. And we'll look forward to February 12th in the next Haddon Forum from Dr. Moody in sociology. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And anyone who's asking about emailing is more than welcome to send me an email with questions or comments. Great, thanks Natalie. I think we've got a few holdovers, but I am gonna uh, log off here and uh, I appreciate a great talk. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll see you later. Yep, bye.